for bad. No, you didn't. Hi, welcome. This is the third day of Creative Strings Workshop, the 10th annual Creative Strings Workshop. For everybody online joining us, uh, I'm Christian Howes, and I'm joined by my good friend and our very special guest, Robert Anderson. And we are going to talk about sort of an overview of the various problems and answers and questions you might have regarding amplifying bowed string instruments. Um, I'm going to start out, and as we get going, Rob is going to correct me and, uh, and offer, uh, offer his, his uh, views. And um, so I'm just going to start. We've got people here live as well during our, our week here at the Creative Strings Workshop. So feel free to ask questions anytime. And those of you that are live with us online, you can comment if you like. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about the three ways that you can amplify a bowed string instrument. The first way, and anytime, Rob, feel free to cut me off. But the first, and, and the pros and cons of each of these ways. So the first way that you can amplify an acoustic violin, or cello, or viola, or bass, is by putting a microphone in front of the instrument. Now, the benefit of amplifying with a microphone is that you're going to get probably the closest representation of that acoustic instrument. It won't be identical to your sound. It'll go through a microphone, and every microphone is going to add its own characteristic. But if you're looking for a pure, quote unquote, acoustic sound, then you can put a microphone in front of your instrument. And that's going to give you the closest, probably the closest sound to your natural acoustic sound. Now remember that no matter where you are, the sound of your instrument is always going to change depending on the environment. If you're in your bathroom, your instrument's going to sound different. If you're in this room, it's going to sound different. If you're outside, it's going to sound different. So your instrument doesn't just have a sound, it has a sound specific to whatever environment it's in. And the same thing is going to be true when you amplify with a microphone or any other way. Having said that, the biggest advantage of using a microphone, in my opinion, is that you get a close representation of your acoustic instrument. The biggest disadvantage of using a microphone is that when you amplify, especially an instrument like this, with a microphone, if you have a drummer or an electric guitar player or a lot of noise going on, then those other sounds are going to bleed into that microphone. So there's a, there's a likelihood that you might get feedback. Um, another disadvantage of going through a microphone is that usually you might have someone outside that's controlling the volume of that microphone, the EQ of that microphone, so you're sort of out of control of your sound. So that's that's number one method for amplifying a bow string instrument. Number two, you can have a pickup. Now I have, on my acoustic violin, I have a pickup made by Yamaha. It's called the VN-P1. And you can see that the pickup is actually fully attached to this bridge. Part of the reason this is a great pickup, the Yamaha pickup, is because they actually have two pickups which are totally intact with the bridge. So the strings vibrate, they go through the bridge, and instead of coming out of this chamber and going into a microphone, they go through this pickup and it comes out of here into your cable and into your speaker. So I'm just going to demonstrate the sound of this pickup really quick. First of all, I'll play my violin acoustically. And now I'll play it with a pickup. So it's still pretty close, but it is a little different. And some people might say that the pickup sound is going to be different than the mic sound slightly. So, if you compare this to the sound of a mic, you may have a little more coloration that's coming through your pickup. But the advantage is going to be that you're going to have less problems with feedback. 
Um, so you can play at a louder volume, you can add effects to your instrument like distortion without worrying about feeding back to a point. The problem is if you get really, really loud, I'm talking like playing with a metallic then at a certain point you're start you're gonna start getting feedback even with a pickup on this instrument. And I've used this pickup on this violin with distortion. I'll even I should just demonstrate that. So if I put a little distortion on
But then when we apply the effects, Sort of like 
cheaper pickups, but then if you're with a band, you're, again, they might be back, or you know, there's just a lot of reasons that they may not be, you know. You won't, you won't see a, a, you know, a player who plays electric all the time real seriously with something that just, just clips on or slides in or sticks on or straps on. They just, they just don't have the, the consistency. They don't, they don't sound as good. This, and, and I forgot to mention this, but in the case of my acoustic violin with the pickup, I also, when I record in the studio, the last three studio albums that I made, um, the way we recorded was we ran the pickup and we ran two mics, a close mic and a far mic, and we blended those three signals. A lot of times when I perform live, I'll do something uh, similar. I might have, especially if it's a more like a classical sounding gig or a more acoustic sounding gig, I might have the pickup running to the PA and also a microphone running. Um, and then you can blend the mic and the pickup and you can really control it because the pickup gives you certain qualities that you may, may really want to have. Um, I don't know, would you say anything more about that? Have you experimented with that yourself? Uh, I haven't done a lot. I know, I know a lot of people that do and they make, they make uh, preamps, which we can talk about in a little bit too, that where you can plug a mic and a pickup in and you can control them all together and they can come out and blend it yourself almost like a mixer. So there's, there's, it's not unusual for, for acoustic instruments to amplify in both ways. You get a stronger, more direct signal going direct with the cables than you do playing into a mic. Definitely more, more consistent. Well, great. I want to talk a little bit about effects next, if that's okay. Anybody have any questions about mic versus pickup versus, versus blending versus solid body? Yes? How much, how much is the mic, I mean, the pickup that's embedded in the bridge? The Yamaha VNP1, which is a violin pickup, um, I don't quote me, but I'm gonna. I think it's under two hundred and fifty dollars. And if you're looking for a good pickup, uh, I mean, here in Columbus, we've got a great shop called the Loft Violin Shop, and they actually um, they mount they mount the pickup, and they do an extra sturdy mount here which I'll just show you. It's basically like um, a, a, uh, a chin rest mount, but they put it here so that it's extra sturdy because you know I tend to jump around and you put jacks in there, you want it to be really sturdy. But um, so the, here locally in Columbus, the Law Violin Shop has done that for me. But also in general, the electric violin shop is great because they, they kind of understand all these issues and you can call them on the phone. It's like electricviolinshop.com. You call them and they can answer these types of questions. You can even tell them, <laughs> I want to use what Chris House has <laughs> at the electric violin shop or I want to use what Robert Anderson uses and the guys at the electric violin shop, they know and they'll talk to you on the phone for hours and they'll answer every question about anything we're telling you right now pretty much. Um, and they are not sponsoring this clinic, by the way. <laughs> but, but, but they really do do a good job. They really are specialists in this in this area. Any other questions about, yeah? Does it affect the sound of your acoustic instrument? That's right. I meant to mention that as well. I meant, I meant to say that. A lot of purists, um, classical players, are afraid of getting a bridge on the violin that has a pickup sort of embedded as Matt said, because it's adding weight to the wood and maybe muting the wood a little. How much is it muting it? Or having this metal contraptions on your violin. What I can tell you is that in the last three years, I have concertized as a soloist, totally acoustically playing classical violin concertos with this violin. But you've got to take that with a grain of salt because I also am a person who is satisfied with a $2,000 violin. <laughs> So we may have just different ideas about what is necessary mm -hmm. to achieve a classical sound with a violin. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, I think people make too much of an issue about how much it's going to hurt your projection on your instrument. Only you can be the, the, the judge of that if you like do some kind of test on that. I mean, do you have an opinion about that? I do, and it is that I it was I never noticed. You know, again, it's. it's some people have, I think the visual hang-up is the biggest thing in getting used to having a jack clamped on the side for, for some people. Some people don't care at all. And uh, you know, I'm so used to that sort of thing, I don't, I don't even notice anymore. But again, there, there are ways to take it off.
and on fairly easily within just a couple of minutes of bridge lifters. And, and I, 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 there was a point in time when I was doing that every so often. Is that because you would show up to an orchestra gig and you exactly. didn't want people to, to dis, sort of discriminate against you because you're one of those well, electric guys? Well, it, sort of? Yeah, definitely, partially. Yeah, yeah. you know, or, or like, what is that? And I'm showing up with something that sort of, again, at least other people may not think is, was, was right. Oh, he's one of those electric guys. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hang up that some people have. Uh, it's an honest thing. So some people want to be more discreet. Or, or, you know, yeah, you know. sure. But yeah, again, the more it's just a for those people, it would be a little bit of a trade-off. They're not going to get as good of a sound. And some people obviously have their summer instruments, you know, or whatever, fitted with a pickup, and then they have their fine instruments that they they leave. And you can get a double violin case. <laughs> you can have them both if you want. And if you're going to be playing amplified most of the time, you probably don't need a ten thousand dollar, fifty thousand dollar violin. You're going to be amplifying it after all. You know, it doesn't need to have the most projection in the world. Um, and as we're going to get into effects, you can do a lot to shape the tone of the instrument with the effects, with the amplified tone, I should say, with the effects. And that's, a, that's an important part of, of plugging in. You know, and even before I go to effects, that raises another question for me. Because many classical string players, um, what, or I should say many string players are classically trained. And what you're taught as a classical violinist is to make the most sound possible so that you can project into a hall over an orchestra. But when you amplify, everything is turned on its head. So that's really drastically going to affect your bow technique, especially. Um, you know, because if, if I was playing, um, I'll, I'll use the acoustic here to, to illustrate. If I was playing a, a classical violin concerto in this room, but I would use a lot of bow, and I would use bowings that had been mapped out and practiced. You know, let's say... Um So you get additional dynamic and tone control 
when you're plugged in, if that makes sense. So it, now you, have, you still have your bow, you still have, uh, you can still do all the dynamics that you're used to, but there's an override switch, so you can set an amp, you can set your effects certain ways to, to totally alter the way you play on, on either side, like I said. Um, somebody watching from home wants to know what kind of pickup you would suggest for a viola or a cello. It's a great question. Yeah, because I don't think Yamaha has a, a pickup for a viola or a cello. I know that for the cello, um, some people like uh, the David Gage, G-A-G-E, the David Gage. Actually, let's ask Greg Byers. That's the exact pickup I use, the David Gage, the realist. I have that for my bass, too. Um, that's the one I've had the most success with. I've heard about the band as well. Um. David Gage, I think, is, is probably the winner. Yeah, G-A-G-E, David Gage, for, for cello. And as far as viola, they may have, he may have, I'm not sure, do you know, Rob? Uh, no, I'm not sure, actually. That's a great question. I do know also that a lot of the pickups that are available, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a subset of pickups that you know, clip on, strap on, things like that, but almost works on any vibrating instrument. And um, they're less expensive sometimes, and it, it could be a good way, good place to start if you have a hard time finding a pickup for a bill. But I know they're out there. I, I, I don't want to misspeak and say something's around that's not. But, yeah. You know. And that's that's an area where we might disagree because I feel like Rob is being very generous to the to some of the cheaper pickups. And, and maybe, but again, maybe I'm confessing that I'm a little bit of a snob about the cheap pickups. I, I mean, to me, it's just like, oh, I'm, I, they just have such limitations. But again, it depends what context you're going to use them in. So. Well, I'm, I think I'm just saying that if someone has, has is not quite ready to invest a lot of money or have a, you know, uh, a pickup semi-permanently attached to their instrument, it's no reason to not try to get started. Maybe I don't, you know, they point. definitely don't sound as good. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But once you, a serious player will have something that's, you know, that's, that's permanent. That's going to be the same every night. That's going to be consistent. Sound good, you know, and uh, in, in different settings, not just sort of something that you can stick on. That's a fair point. No, that's they, I think that's, that's, that's a fair point. That's, and they are so cheap that, I mean, so inexpensive that <laughs> that, that you, you, it wouldn't cost you that much to try this for. Okay, good. Well, shall we go into effects then? Are there, unless there's any other questions, we'll go into effects. I would love if it's okay with you, Rob, for us to go back and forth, one effect at a time. Maybe we can just cover like five or six of like the most common effects, talk just quickly about what they do, maybe demonstrate them, talk about the parameters, and I'd love for you to go first. Okay, I'll go first. I uh, have been playing with uh, electronic effects, with, with, with pickups, and with electric violins for uh, a long time now, for, for probably almost 15 years, and over the course of those 15 years, so many more. I mean, when I when I, when I started, the Yamaha didn't even have these instruments, and I was just searching and searching for instruments to plug in and play jazz and play rock, and experimenting with different guitar pedals and guitar effects and guitar cables, because um, that's all there was. And, and even still today, I think most of what we use are, are effects and cables that were you know geared for the Electric guitar player. That's obviously a huge market, and that's where the things are. And sometimes they don't necessarily, you know, they need a little tweaking, and the settings might be different than a guitar player would use because of the timbre of our instruments and because of the fact that we use a bow. So after experimenting with all kinds of different pedals, pedal boards this big, multi effects pedals, which is a one box that may have volume and, and, and hundreds, literally, of effects in one box. Uh, I've come to a few different uh, conclusions, and, and similar to what I was saying, pickups, acoustic with pickups, and electrics, there's different settings that certain, certain pedal boards are better for. I've come to the conclusion that the most useful setup that I, I've ever put together is this small pedal board here, which I don't know if you can see. I've got a preamp, I've got a reverb pedal, I've got a delay pedal, I've got a compressor, and I have a pitch shifter. So I have five devices velcroed down on this little aluminum board. They're always plugged in together. I can plug in one uh, DC adapter. I plug my instrument into one side. This will hold it up. My instrument's plugged into one side. One cable comes out the other side of this device, goes into the amp. And so I can take it from gig to gig, and, and I don't have to worry about hooking up different pedals and worry about like, plugging things in backwards. So that's the basic setup 
of a, of a pedal board. And this is a, a they're smaller ones, but this is a, a fairly small, you see, you've probably seen guitar players with, you know, looks like the Starship Enterprise around here. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I found this is, this is useful. I don't have a, a distortion pedal on this one because I, I just found that I rarely use it. Uh, I do like playing distortion, and I have distortion pedals, but on my, on, I, I rarely used it, and the real estate on this little board was pretty precious, so I ended up switching that. So I will start uh, by mentioning the preamp briefly, because it's an often an overlooked piece of equipment, and it's something that a lot of people have a hard time understanding what it is. It's like you have an amp, okay, and then what's a, what the heck is a preamp, right? With, with the way that uh, string instrument pickups work, with some few exceptions, the way they work probably 98% of the time is by, uh, with pickups called piezo pickups. They're pickups that pick up, that pick up vibrations in, in wood or it, whatever substance they're mounted on. They pick up vibrations. Right? They, they're probably not going to hear my voice because it doesn't pick up vibrations in the air. It only picks up vibrations in a solid substance. Right? So this strings vibrate. Strings vibrate and it picks that up. I mean, you turn it to the, to the to 11 and you talk. If your voice makes the instrument vibrate and then it picks up your voice like this is it. Piezo pickups often have a fairly low output, a low sort of lower level of output. And sometimes it's nice to get that output boosted before running through pedals, before running into an amp to help round out your tone. Or it allows you to not to turn the amp up so high because your tone is boosted going into that amp. To boost the level of your sound or going into a, a PA. With the preamp, you can, with many preamps, I'm not going to like mention names, I guess, right? Um, I happen to use a, a preamp, an LR Bags preamp. They make a lot of acoustic uh, amplification uh, products. And I use a preamp made by, designed for uh, acoustic guitars by LR Bags. It has a lot of EQ on it. So the EQ allows me to boost certain frequencies, to reduce certain frequencies. Again, like, like Greg was saying earlier, in, 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 that he uses in Ableton, it can boost certain frequencies and, and look, cut certain frequencies to really change the sound of the instrument. If, I, if I'm getting too many booms when I bump into things, I can cut the low frequencies down and kind of minimizes that. If I boost the low frequencies, I get like a full-on thunder. You know, like if, if, it sound, if, if the PA that I'm playing through it just sounds too bright or too tinny because of the way that the, the, the person has set the PA or that the, the room is, I can turn the trebles down. And so I spend a lot of time with that. Having that on my pedal board gives me the consistency of wherever I go, I'm more likely to have the same electric tone, as opposed to just being dependent on whatever amp shows up at the place, or being more independent on whatever uh, PA I'm plugged into, or whoever's running the PA. It helps give me more consistency with the tone. It also allows me to, as you may have noted, uh, just mute myself. It's one of the most useful things. Chris has a volume pedal there. I just have a mute, so you know. When I meet myself, a tuner appears, and I can also tune silently. You know, it's kind of helpful if you're on stage and it's kind of noisy, and, and even in fact, in the middle of a song, I can just look down and tune. I have fine tuners. With, I can probably not, even if I don't hear myself at all, I can look down and check my A. Yeah, silently. It's very useful to be able to cut yourself off on the PA, and then you can unplug without worrying about noise. Right? You can switch instruments, which sometimes I, I have to do. Um, it allows me to boost my signal. So instead of a volume knob, I have two levels, which is, I can't, just for me, I found that's kind of all I need most of the time. A, a blending level, or like most of the time level, or then a solo level, or, or like a, I'm going to be louder for a few minutes level. Or, you know, I, I sound check at the lower level, and I think the sound guy has me turned down too low surreptitiously. So that, that's what the preamp does. The last thing the preamp does for me is it has something called an effects loop. It allows me to take a cable from the back of the preamp, run it through all my other pedals, and then I plug it back into the preamp, and then all my pedals are in a loop controlled by this device. I can send a line out to the PA, I can be, uh, I can be plugged into an amp all at the same time, and all my effects are controlled through the preamp. So it's sort of like the mothership of the pedal board in that way. And I think uh, a lot of people ask me, like, what pedal should I get first? And, in, in some time, and most of the time, I say, like, just find a good preamp. Find a good, useful preamp. You know, with a mute, a tuner, things like that. Um, Multi-effects pedals, like, 
like Chris has here, often have all that stuff built into it. But if you're going to build a pedalboard, preamp is a great place to start. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that for the, for the preamp. That's brilliant. Thanks, Rob. And, and that actually takes me to talk about the multi effects pedal, which is, which is my solution. It's, uh, it's uh, maybe in some ways not as sophisticated as uh, Robert's. Um, he's got these several pedals in one, all Velcroed down, as he said. And uh, I'm kind of lazy, so I didn't want to, I couldn't make one of those things. So he's got all these separate pedals, like you said, a reverb pedal, um, a, a pitch shifter pedal. All those are built into this multi effects pedal. Um, so one of the advantages for me is that I just have one pedal. Um, I don't have lots of pedals. But one of the disadvantages is uh, that I'm tied to the, you know, the ability of this particular multi effects pedal. And then that's when you start talking about digital versus analog, and I'm not an expert on it, but a lot of people will say that, you know, they, they like to use separate pedals because they can, they can choose from so many, and whereas I'm bound to the ones that are offered in this particular multi effects pedal. I like this multi effect pedal because, as Rob said, it functions as a preamp, first of all. So it, I think of that as something that warms my sound. So if you go directly from your electric violin or from your pickup into a PA or into an amp, it still may not have the full body that you want until you run it through a preamp. Is that a, is that a fair way to say it? Yeah, well, especially certain guitar amps. And we, you know, of course, there, there are very few string instrument amps, a bowed instrument amps, like a violin amp, that I don't really know of any that I would recommend. And certain guitar amps, maybe some tube amps, and definitely some like the big amps that are often used for electric guitars, uh, I, you know, I'm plugged into them, even with a nice pickup, and you hear the, the most shrill tone you ever heard. And you know, the preamp, even then, can make your tone more, more consistent between different settings. So it can be useful. You don't have to go to a gig, and all of a sudden you plug in, and, and this happened to me before. I, I, I remember playing with a singer-songwriter, sort of a, a country singer in a very small place, called Angus Cohen, in a like, very intimate little place, and probably seats 30 people. And I was plugging into the PA, and I, I didn't have a pedal board, I just plugged in direct. And my tone was, I heard it was worse than I ever heard in my life. And I had no control, there was nothing I could do. It couldn't turn up, it couldn't turn down. Every note I played was just like piercing, and I couldn't play. I mean, it was a horrible experience. And again, I, I was out of control, and it was because I wasn't really prepared with my PA. I wasn't prepared to, to sort of, no matter what happens, be in control of my tone. Of course, that's something we want. Yeah. And when we're plugging in at a venue, you know, we're, we're at the mercy of that amp or that PA system. Really up. I mean, that actually makes me want to talk about amps because <laughs> because if you, if you don't have, especially if you don't have a preamp, then you 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 can have an amplifier like this acoustic guitar amplifier. This happens to be a Fishman acoustic guitar amplifier. Um, I would always have this amplifier with me, um, even if the venue has a PA, for a couple reasons. First of all, because I can control my sound with the amp. I've got certain uh, features on this amp, like I have reverb built into this amp, and it happens to be decent reverb, whereas Robert has his own reverb pedal, which he knows he can rely on. I've got my reverb right here. I've also got a little bit of EQ here. I can control my volume. What I would normally do is I would either tilt the amp back like that so that it's facing up to me so I can hear it. Usually, I'll go even more than that. I will literally put it that high or even higher. And I'll stand pretty much right in front of it so it's coming right in my ear. Because the, one of the worst things on gigs when you can't hear yourself and then you start playing too high and too loud and it's not musical. You're just trying to fight to hear yourself. That's not that, yeah, it like defeats the purpose of being electric. So by having your monitor, having control of it with my master level and having it pointing right into my ear, that makes me the most comfortable. You know? Um, so I, I'm guessing that Rob will agree with me that as far as there are several amplifiers now, 10 years ago they weren't, but there are several now, most of the time they're called an acoustic model. And I can think of this Fishman, 
Um, AER, I think it's great. Acoustic Image, I think is a great one. Fender uh, is the one that I use. Fender Acoustic Sonic. Fender Acoustic Sonic. Yeah, this stuff's good. And, and again, the mo even with Chris's pedal, the mic, you know, it gives you a little more consistency. You know, you don't have to rely on that. But we, but we, if you're if, it, if you're lucky enough to get an amp that's like portable like this and bring it around and use it as part of your rig, there you go. You know, that's, that's your sound. So I'll talk quickly about um, a couple really quick effects here. I've got delay on this pedal, and Rob might have a delay pedal, but I have delay as part of this multi-effect pedal. So delay, you can hear the delay. You can control how long the delay is. And you can also control how long it continues to go or how loud it is. So that's delay, it's basically echo. Um, I have various kinds of, of modulation, like flanger, and, or that was phaser, this is flanger. And again, for each of these effects, you can control various parameters. And uh, over here we have distortion, you already heard that. Again, you can control how much distortion, how bright, how dark it is. Um, and uh, I will talk about, on this, on this particular pedal, I have a expression pedal. My volume pedal, well, first of all, I have a volume pedal, which I can control my volume. But if I step down on it, it becomes an expression pedal. So now I can control things like wah wah. <laughs> Um, pitch uh, octave. Or octave lower. And uh, it bears, it's worth mentioning that I've got this um, effects pedal and loop pedal all in hardware form. But earlier, Greg Byers, cellogreg.com, Greg Byers, he gave us a presentation which you can actually see on my YouTube channel. He gave an hour long presentation today, which was amazing. Um, he does all of these same things with a laptop and an auxiliary pedal called a soft step pedal. So you don't have to have hardware that you carry around. You can do it with a laptop. Um, but I'll let Rob talk a little more about any other effects or anything else. Yeah, real, real briefly, just uh, I have these effects in a certain order, and I'll go. It doesn't matter what order you put them in, because once you have one effect changing your sound, and then as it moves to the next pedal, then that next pedal is going to be changing the sound plus the sound that was changed by the by the previous pedal. And then you know if you kind of put your pedals in a funny order, you can you can get sort of undesirable types of effects. One of the, the pedals that goes, I'll start last. The, one of the last pedal in my chain, so to speak, is that reverb pedal. And I know we, we, it, reverb's another thing that maybe a lot, some people don't understand, they ask me about. And I found that, well, in a room like this, it's, you, know, you really don't need it, but I so rarely play, in a room like this, you know, play Amplified, for example. This is a concert ball, or a recital ball, and it's designed to have an acoustic, it's designed to, you know, not play it, right? And so it's kind of a little bit hard to tell. I was experimenting earlier. When I turn off my reverb, there's not on the hand for me, right? If I turn off the reverb, my sound is completely dry. I live in the room, we're in a great room, so. If I put on my reverb, uh, this is, my, I think this is, unless it got moved, this is the setting I normally use. Oh no, that's way more than I normally use. But you can, you can hear, you can hear it ringing.
unnatural sound through the speaker or through your headphones because there's not that reverberation that we naturally hear in a room like this. Now, our instruments were made to be played in rooms like this. It was designed to be listened to from where you guys are sitting, and I'm standing here playing my uh, acoustic instrument, right? When, that's another reason it's kind of odd sometimes when you put a microphone right up here. You know, our instruments weren't designed to be heard like this. And that's how our pickups are. So using the reverb, it sort of creates an artificial sense of space in our tone. And of course, I said it to the extreme, so just to make the point. Right, but... I remember in college, you know, I'd love, when it would be really late at night at music school, I would go into the stairwell and, and practice my Bach, and it felt like, you know, like hyphens because of the, the natural <laughs> reverb. And then, oh my God. And then I'd go to my lesson, and it sounded like crap. It always <laughs> But the, the teaching studios don't have a great acoustic environment. I mean, I should have brought my reverb pedal. That's the trick. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I have it set fairly subtle. In fact, I leave it on all the time. Every gig, I never turn it off. And if they have reverb in the sound booth, I'll ask them not to use theirs. I'll just leave it on mine. And it, it makes an incredible difference, again, in, my, in how I'm comfortable I feel when I'm playing. I feel like my tone is more natural. And you know, there's, there's no worse feeling than you plug in. And like, like every sound you're getting is just wrong, and you can't do anything. So the reverb plays a huge role in giving what I feel to be a natural tone. And again, that has nothing to do with the pickup, per se. It has just to do with the nature of this is an electrical signal you know, being converted from vibrations back into vibrations. And without that re uh, reverberation of a room like this, it sounds really unnatural to me. The, ne the, the next pedal working backwards is the delay pedal, like Chris has. I, I have it set pretty extreme. with your technique, 
but now also with, with you know, other external devices. And you just sort of find the sound that you just leave on. It's not just to put on and be weird and wacky or to you know, shred. It's just you just kind of have it there all the time. Lastly, I have uh, another effect that took me a long time to sort of figure out. I think I'm still figuring out how to make it useful, but I have a, it's called a compressor pedal. It helps control your dynamics. And it, it actually, in, in most applications, the purpose of the comp compressor is to sort of reduce the dynamics that you can play. It can take softer notes and bring them up. Let's say if, I, if this is my lowest pianissimo, this is my loudest fortissimo, you know, the, you can use the compressor so that the sound that comes out the amp it don't, no matter how soft I play, it wouldn't be any softer than this or louder than this. If I turn, um, I'll turn everything off except the compressor. This is, this is with no effects. If I turn on the compressor, yeah, I get turned pretty high. You can hear little pops.
after hearing what Rob just said about compression, I really want to use the compression because it's going to even out my pizzicato. Because you're not going to hear the, right now I'm not hearing the higher strings like this, like on this chord. I'm not going to hear that as much if I do this. Yeah. It gets buried. Is it, you know, as you turn the volume up, the E string doesn't last as long. And it's already, the pluck on the E string is like, exactly. So, exactly. So I, I want to use that compression now. We're running out of time, and, and uh, because we have a another uh, live streaming appointment to make in five minutes with the incredible Michael Doucet. So just, I'm going to wrap up, and I want us to play something really quickly, also using my loop pedal. A loop pedal is just simply something that you, you step on it, and it records you, and then you can step on it to stop and, and have the loop go over and over. Um, and uh, I find it to be great for doing solo performances, but also it can be really useful for a duo performance. Um, and so we're, we're going to play a tune using the loop pedal. Um, before we play this last short tune, um, you're, uh, Robert Anderson, what's your website, Rob? Uh, RobertAndersonViolin.com. So you can learn more about Robert Anderson. He's based in LA. He co founded uh, a string project. Los Angeles years ago, but he's doing all kinds of independent stuff. An amazing teacher, among, uh, an amazing a uh, player. He's got a lot of uh, charts and uh, teaching materials that he's that he's uh, developed. And uh, I've brought him here to the Creative Strings Workshop a few times, and he's directed our youth ensemble just amazingly well again this year. Um, so check him out. You can also check out resources that I have at ChristianHouse.com, and I just happen to have this called the electric violin training kit, which covers a lot of this stuff, and you can actually buy it on my website for $1, believe it or not, as a PDF, as a downloadable PDF. Um, we mentioned some resources. Uh, we're both uh, it, uh, endorsing the Yamaha uh, brand, uh, the Yamaha electric violins, and we both had a close relationship with Yamaha for a long time. I personally have worked with Yamaha for almost 15 years now. Um, and I also want to thank Diodario, who is a huge sponsor uh, for me and for this, this workshop. Um, I did mention um, the electric violin shop before, but I'll mention it again. Uh, they're just a great resource if you're looking for any of this stuff. Electricviolinshop.com, uh, give them a call. Um, last promotional housekeeping, and we'll play our final song, and then we're going to end this and bring Michael Doucet to do his presentation. Um, is, again, if you're out there watching online, we are streaming every day from the Creative Streams Workshop. This is the 10th annual Creative Streams Workshop happening for a whole week. String players from around the world, they get together and we, we share and network and learn all week long. Uh, so we've got a hashtag on, on Twitter, that's Creative Streams Workshop. You can join the Creative String Players communities on Google+, on Facebook, on LinkedIn and uh, tweet, share, and all that stuff. So we're just going to play a standard. I think it's going to be fun to use the loop pedal. And uh, I'm going to ask Rob to maybe choose a, a, a standard. I think a fun one to do would be uh, minor blues with, uh, with Spider-Man. Do you know Spider-Man? I'll back you up. The, 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 you're going to set it? OK, it's, it's a.
try some of this stuff out. Um, but we do have to get ready for Michael to say. So uh, um, stick around because that's going to be great. Are you up for it, Michael? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Woo.